Will you pray with me before we look at the word of God and we'll ask God to bless our lives. Father, we thank you for the opportunity of coming together. We thank you, Lord, that you're sovereign. We thank you that you sit on the throne. You're high and lifted up, O oh God. There was none like you, O oh Father. Even as we read the text this morning, O oh God, in one after the other, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We were reminded of the fact that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the sovereign God, and Father, we thank you that because you are sovereign and you rule, we can absolutely and completely trust in you. We pray, O oh God, this morning as we look at your word, you would allow us to understand, O oh Father, that you have called us with a purpose. And Father, that the church will recognize that they don't have to be like Israel, forgetting that you call them with a purpose and they choose not to accept your purpose. But, oh, Father, I pray that you would help us see, oh God, that you have a plan, you have a purpose. And because you have a plan and a purpose, if we subject ourselves to you, oh God, and render unto God what belongs to God, Master, we can see this world reached with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And everywhere, anywhere, we can see the gospel proclaimed through the ministry of your church. And so, Father, we ask you to minister to us this day. We ask this all in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Well, I want you to turn in your Bible, and I want you to look at the text that was read to us. It is a text that sits in the context of Jesus coming into the last week before he goes to the cross. And now Jesus had ministered maybe about three, three and a half years, and his disciples have been with him. He had selected them, and they've traveled with him, and they traveled all the way up to the northern part of Israel and came back to the southern part. But every time he went with them, and every time they went with him, God spoke clearly the truths that belong to God, and he clearly proclaimed what was truth from falsity. And it's very clear, every time he taught, he used those terms. It has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but that is not how it was in the beginning. And what it was that he was trying to help the people of Israel understand, help his disciples understand, is that you've taken the truth of God, you've taken the revelation of God, you traditionalize it in what you wanted it to become, and you've turned it into something that's contrary to what God has said. And it's in this context that Jesus is coming now, after teaching it to his people for almost three and a half years, that he's coming to the last week before they're going to crucify him. And it says that the people the leadership of Israel, the spiritual leadership of Israel, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, you know, all those who actually were the ones that received the truth and should have been upholding the truth, were now trying to see how can we entangle Christ in his word? How can we get him to contradict himself, and in so contradicting himself, we would lose the credibility of the sovereign king. And they didn't want him to be acknowledged as king, and they were looking of ways of how they can do it. And so, you know, Matthew, as he records, he says, then the Pharisees went, and they plotted how they may entangle him in his words. And even today, those who do not want to acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that he is God who came in the form of man, incarnated into the midst of us, and walked and talked in the midst of people, and lived the life of righteousness and godliness, they would declare that Jesus was not the Christ, that he was not the son of God, and he was a good man. Every Hindu would say that too, that Jesus is a godly man, a good man, 
And some of them may even say he is one of the many gods that exist, but they will never say he is the only true living God. And mankind has come to that con con conclusion, and as a result of that, they will not render unto God what belongs to God. They will not render unto God what is his. And so they come to Jesus, and they say to Jesus, Jesus, help us understand. We know that you are not easily worried about people. You're a man of truth, and you speak the truth, and you're not aware of all, uh, worried about what others would say. And he says, we want to ask you a question. Help us understand whether we should actually give Caesar taxes and money that needs to be given to him. And when, he look, when they look at it, Jesus says, I know these guys are trying to test me. And he says, why are you trying to test me, you hypocrites? You hypocrites. And he actually uses some very strong words to the religious people that are standing there. And all these people are now listening to Jesus Christ. You have to remember, they have just you know, a few days ago, acknowledged him as king. They put him on a donkey. They allowed him to actually walk through. They sang Hosanna to him and was stimulated to realize, yes, he is the son of God. Yes, he is the king of kings. <coughs> yes, he is the Messiah. And now, here are these leaders, the religious leaders, trying to say, don't you accept this as fact? And so they come to him, and they're trying to disconnect him from the people. And he's try they're trying to prevent him. So they're trying to entangle him in his word so that he will disqualify himself. So he says to them, help me understand, what is the emblem on this coin that you're talking about that you want to pay your taxes with? And when they look, bring the coin and they brought it to him, it was a denarius. And, he, and Jesus said to him, what likeness is on this inscription? And, he, and they said, Caesar's. And it is in the context of that, he says, render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and unto God what belongs to God. And I want to suggest this morning that the message that God was trying to help the people of Israel, the leadership of the religious leadership of Israel, and those who were there, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and all the people that were there, that there are truly true images that we're going to talk about this morning. The first was the image with which you want to pay your taxes. And he says, what are you going to pay your taxes with? Obviously, you know, in Israel, there were two different kinds of coins that they used. One was the coin that they used to pay their tithes, and it was different from that of which they paid their taxes, which belongs to Caesar. But Jesus was talking about something even more significant, and that was the image in which mankind was made. And he was saying to render unto God what belongs to God. And if nobody else understood it, the people of Israel understood it because they knew mankind was made in the image of God. And even though they were made in the image of God, they chose to break their relationship with God. And the consequence of that is mankind began to serve God. Satan rather than God himself. In the book of Ephesians, very clearly, in that second chapter, the apostle Paul is helping the people of Israel understand, once you were made in, with, you, you were dead, once you were made by God, and when he made you, you were without sin. But when you became dead in the trespasses and sin, he says, you came under the authority of the evil one. You came under the authority of this world. You came under the authority of your flesh. You came under the authority of the physical ideology of this world. And you chose to reject God. And in the process, you took on 
a life of rejection of living for God and began to live for yourself. And Paul was saying, writing to a, 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 not a Jewish community, but more a Gentile community, and he's saying, you're living under the power of darkness. But God was gracious. He was loving. And in, because of his grace and his mercy, you know what God did? He sent his son into this world. And when he sent his son into this world, he died for us. And because he died for us, we are redeemed. And because we are a redeemed community, we no longer need to live on the power of darkness. In the book of Colossians, we were studying in our Sunday school class, Paul was writing to the church of Colossae, and he was saying over there that we have been delivered from the dominion of darkness, and we are being translated into the kingdom of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, where we have redemption and love. And it's so important for us to realize that there are two communities of people that live in this world. Those that live under darkness and those that are under the world and those who came to a knowledge of Jesus Christ and are living in the light, living by the truth, living in the context of the righteousness of God or the empowerment of God's spirit that dwells within us. So the physical is not controlling us now the spiritual begins to control us, and we now can live for the praise of his glory. And so when God was talking, when Jesus was talking to the people of Israel, he was telling them, listen, guys, I want you to understand. I want you to understand that you can render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but I want you to understand there's a part that belongs to God, and you need to render unto God what belongs to God. And I believe the most significant thing that is important to God is us. It's not our money. It's not our wealth. It is we who have been made in his image that belongs to us. But when you look at the context of this text, you begin to realize that Israel was having a hard time rendering unto God what belongs to God, at least for at least three things. And I think the first thing I want you to make an observation was they did not want to affirm that Jesus was the Christ. And the very first thing in order for us as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to come to the conviction in our heart that if you're going to become, move away from the physical, move away into the spiritual and render unto God what belongs to God because he's restoring us, he's transfer, translating us, and he's transforming us into the image of his son again through the righteousness of his word, through the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives, through the relationship that we have with him. And when we come to the realization that God is working in us, working in us, trying to transform us, breaking us, and reshaping us so that we become like his son, beautiful, and the righteousness of God. The first thing is we have to accept that Jesus is the Christ. We cannot say, I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ and be confused of the fact that Jesus is the Christ. Only in the knowledge that Jesus is the Christ can we come into that dynamic relationship with God that he transforms us and places us under his authority. And when we come to that place where we place ourselves under the authority of Christ, then alone can we do it. Jesus was walking with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi. And while he was walking with his disciples in Caesarea Philippi, which means he went all the way from Jerusalem, and they traveled all the way to the northern part, and he said, okay, it's time for us to turn around and get back on the journey coming down to, back to Jerusalem. And when he turned around, he said, before we go, I want to ask you a question. And he asked them that question, whom do people say that I am? 
And you know, they responded and said something that you are, you know, John the Baptist, other things uh, that you are El uh, um, Elijah, some things that you, you are the spirit of John the Baptist, and so on and so forth. They gave a prophet from the Old Testament. But then Jesus shifted from a general question, and here's why I think he shifted, because it's so important for understand that our confession that Jesus, who Jesus is, is significant in our willingness to render unto God what belongs to God. And the problem is we don't want to confess that Jesus, who Jesus is. And this morning, it's important for you to understand that Jesus asked them the second question. And the second question is, okay, guys, you tell me all about what other people say about me. Now tell me, whom do you say that I am? And all of a sudden, there's a silence in the midst of the people. And then one of them declares, Jesus, thou art the Christ the son of the living God. If you want to follow that text and read through that text when you get back home, you can read it in Matthew chapter 16 or actually even in Mark chapter 8. And you'll see the progression of Christ's interaction with his disciples, trying to help them come to the conviction that it's not enough what other people say about me. It is important for you to understand that if you're going to give yourself to me, if you're going to give yourself to my mission, if you're going to come to that place in your life where you're going to enable what is on my heart, which is to build the church and establish the church of Jesus Christ, you've got to come to the conviction that I am the Christ. Now, Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, Peter, flesh and blood has not Reveal this to you, but my Father, who is in heaven. And then he says, Peter, I want you to understand, upon this confession, I will build my church. The mission of God is all about building this called out community that is going to live the righteousness of God. But before we can live the righteousness of God, we have to acknowledge him that thou art the king, you are the son of the living God, you are the Christos, you are the Messiah, and I am willing to place myself and move myself from being under the authority of this world, from being under the authority of Satan, being under the authority of my own flesh, being under the authority of the philosophy of these kingdoms, and come and place myself under your authority. And church, this morning, I believe what God is asking us to do when he says, render unto God what belongs to God, is he's saying, you were made in my image. You were designed for a relationship with me, but you broke your relationship, and in the process, you lost the image of God. Now I want you to restore it. I want to restore it, but I need for you to render unto me what belongs to me, and that is your entire being, your mind, your soul, your flesh, your resources, your everything. There's nothing that belongs to me. Everything belongs to you. And you put your hands upon it, and God will bless it. And so he says, first of all, if you're going to render unto me what belongs to me, you must come to the conviction that I am the Christ, the son of the living God. Israel was fighting him all the way. They'd never wanted him. Oh, he's a carpenter. How can anything good come out of Nazareth? Who is this guy? But Jesus is saying, render unto God what belongs to God. The second reason why Israel was finding it hard to render to God what belonged to God was the Jewish people tended to be quite religious. They were a religious community. They had turned the relationship of God into a religion. They had actually taken the truths of God and turned it into a practice that manifested 
a way of living that is actually religious. It was not in conformity. That's why Jesus had to remind them over and over again, this is not how it was in the beginning. And so what they did was they would really say to God, God, we want you to understand, God, this actually you can have. You want my tithe? You can have it. You want me to keep the Sabbath? I'll keep it. You want me to come and do all these different traditions that we practice and do all these rituals? I will do it. But the rest of the time, leave it to me. I'll take care of it. And I think that's how we are as a church of Jesus Christ too sometimes. What happens to us is we say, God, this actually you can have. But Lord, my job, it belongs to me. Don't ask me to go on Monday morning and live for you in the midst of my people that I'm working with. I don't know if you've ever read a book, but the book is called Monday Morning Atheist. Have you ever heard that book, the title of that book? If you ever want to read a good book about how we live our Christianity, read that book, Monday Morning Atheist. And in that book, the idea is that on Sunday, I became a follower of Jesus Christ. But on Monday morning, you know what happens to me? I go to work and I become like the rest of the world. I have dichotomized between what I call truth and what I call belongs to me. It's not even between truth and falsity, what is mine and what is his. And I've not come to the realization that the day I said your Lord and King, that I've handed over everything to him. But what we need to come in order to become God's lights in the midst of a world of darkness, we need to come to that place that we say, Lord, you're not only King of kings and Lord of lords, but Lord, all of my life, no dichotomization. I'm going to hand everything over to you and we release it to God completely and implicitly. And I think there's a third reason that Israel found it difficult to render unto God. And the third reason is that Israel viewed surrendering to Jesus Christ would mean surrendering their power, their authority, their rule, their reign, and they wanted to have control what belonged to them, and they didn't see that Christ could empower them and increasingly in a greater way. 